welcome to episode four of The Old Man and the CV. We hope you're enjoying it so far. We've had lots of positive feedback. Remember to keep listening, keep following, and please do keep sharing. Well, we're delighted to be joined by Paul Sanderson, MBE, for this episode. And this is a very special episode because it is the first one that we are doing actually in the studio. Um, Paul is the chaplain at the Littlehampton Academy and the Sir Robert Woodard Academy in Lansing and has 30 years experience in training young people, youth workers, managers and teams on a variety of subjects, including community development, partnership working, self-esteem, communication skills, anger management, team working, drugs awareness, parenting and transition. Paul. Welcome. Good to be here. It's exhausting listening to that list. <laughs> well, talking of that list, can you tell our listeners a little bit more about what you have worked on during your career? Because I know it has been varied. And also because people are going to ask me, why did you receive an MBE? Start with that one, really. I, it, for services to young people in Sussex was the announcement at Buckingham Palace. And for 10 years, I set up a community projects on an estate uh, responding to the needs of the people there, uh, for the children, young people and families. And out of that, activities grew, uh, people's lives started to improve and transform, and we built a great team together. And it was a result of that piece of work that the MBA was given. And that, for me, is off the back of doing lots of community development work, lots of listening, lots of telling stories to motivate and inspire, and creating opportunities so people can get involved in, in making a difference in their own lives and, of course, the wider community that they're in. You mentioned a couple of key things there, and I know that a lot of this ties into your new role. Uh, well, not so new role now, you've been there a while um, at the academies. And mental well being is probably one of the, the big things you have to talk about. So, what are the barriers that poor mental well being brings? Because it's a condition that affects everyone, all ages, all socioeconomic groups. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, correct. We've all got mental health. All of us have got mental health. We've got, if we've got a mind, we've got a brain, we've got mental health. But of course, like in all of that part of our bodies, we can damage it. It can be hurt. And as a result of that, there can be a pain. And looking at some of the barriers is a lot of people I work with, their self-esteem is pretty crushed. Um, their identity, who are they? Why are they? That sense of purpose it melts away often. And so you look to try and see a people group who are feeling insecure about their identity, who they are, very vulnerable to influence from the outside that can be negative. So there are lots of barriers that crop up when your mental health is, is damaged, hurt or broken. So what are some of the, I wouldn't say quick fixes because yeah. that would seem trite, but what are the ways that you can actually break down those barriers? So as an example, you know, we know that exercise and regular exercise is good for you. It takes you out of that environment. It's good for fresh thinking, um, takes you away from the issue for a little bit mentally. And of course, you release all the endorphins and it, it starts working on your mental health as well. But there's that kind of catch 22, isn't there, where you go, well, I've got this time to go out and do this exercise, but mentally I can't face doing the exercise and it's a vicious circle. So how do you stop breaking down that vicious circle? I think particularly recognising the audience you've got with this podcast is there are two halves of life and there is no exact age where we start to reflect on what the second half of life is, but I'm discovering it as a 54 year old myself that it's around now that we look back and think, and our ego is driven. What are we going to achieve? What is our output? What is our legacy? And then suddenly we get to this stage in this age where we ask the bigger questions are, uh, what is my purpose? What is, what is my meaning? Well, you know, why am I here? Not what can I produce or what can I be remembered for, but why am I here? And so within those questions, I'm spending a lot of time helping people pause just pause and stop and just grab hold of the moment, the minute that they're in, who's around them, what's around them. That's why we encourage people to go outside into nature because there's far more places to pause if you walk to work or if you stop at a train station and just, instead of looking at your phone, you look at the birds in the trees opposite and you, you try and work all out all that out. Why, why, why does that bring me peace? What's going on there? There are things that we can do in the outdoors, in what's surrounding us. If we pause and if we try and be in the present, 
And there's so much we've got in the background and our baggage that we carry that often we worry about. And there's so many things in the future that are so uncertain. What about the now? What about the here? When we pause and we're in this present for a lot of people i work with is trying to bring them back to the present to the most important moment and in that moment we do a lot of breathing exercises so you might have heard it you've seen it but taking time just to breathe in through your nose out through your mouth and slowing down your body because you're when you slow down your breathing you slow down your body when you take in the oxygen that gives you the strength to cope when your mind is focused on the most important thing in the world which is breathing when you're focused on that, then these other things don't disappear because they're real, but they start to be put into perspective and to maybe put into the right priority. So if someone's having an anxiety attack, a panic attack because of their mental well-being, we pause, we breathe in through our nose, we breathe out through our mouth. And when calmness comes, and they've done it, not me, I've just given them suggestions into that calmness, we can maybe go backwards what's caused this. We can maybe see if it's in the future what they're worried about, but also celebrate the now, pause and be in the now. So an important point, I guess, of moving on after that pause, and you mentioned it a moment ago, is purpose. Mm. And whatever age we're at, we need purpose. How do you talk to someone when you say about after that pause and they've slowed down and they're, they're open to thinking? How do you work with people to create a sense of purpose or that they create themselves? What are some good uh, little shortcuts for, for finding mm. that sense of purpose? Especially as you referenced earlier, you know, in your 50s, you have a different sense of purpose because mm. of your retrospective views. Coming out of COVID, again, with young people, but more so now with staff, there was a continual rhythm that was coming in the conversations. And that led me to put three statements on the walls of the chapels, their spaces where people can come of all faiths and none, just to be, to pause, to reflect on life. And the first one says, you are loved. And if individuals can know that they're loved, either by a higher power or by a best mate, a friend, a partner, if they've got one, actually knowing that and embracing that, to be loved is to be known and to be known is to be loved. That sense of, well, someone cares about me. So that statement is there for young people to see you are loved. Then it says, you are free. Now, some people rightly challenge me. Oh, no, I don't feel free. I feel you know, tied up by my anxiety, by my fears, by my worries. I said, yes, but a freedom can be found. A freedom can be found. You can be free. So it's a hopeful statement. And then we finish with your life has meaning. And, and it's their statements. Yes, their words. Some might say pithy. But as a young person stares at that, who maybe has been self-harming, maybe what is the point of my life? Why am I here? I don't want to be here. When we go for that conversation, who loves you? And they actually reveal the individual in their life who care for them. And actually, what would they like to be free from? And they say, and we work out plans how to get free from that. Suddenly they realise their life does have meaning. And so those three statements help that that foundation of knowing your love wanted valued, that you can be free from these things, then does lead to that process and understanding of my life, your life has got meaning. Brilliant. That's a fantastic summary. So you obviously work for an organisation where there's a lot of focus on, on well-being, but from an organisational point of view, what tips could you give to those organizations yeah. in how to to manage the the mental well-being facility two ears and one mouth is what we've been blessed with i every morning as i shave my bald head i'm reminded afresh yes we love talking but are we doing twice the amount of listening than we are talking in a day and that's been my mantra with coaching up kids into listening skills um, and support so listening is crucial how do you listen to the people you work with people around you genuine listening not tick box listening we call it consultation i guess in the business trade but making time to give the person who you want to listen to the honesty and the opportunity to be honest and share with you then after that listening where do you create space create space to be create space to pause create space to allow people to engage and converse and yes it might not always be on task with your company or etc but naturally most people do bring it back there but if they knew they're doing it in a space where they've been listened to and i would always ask as a company has they nominated someone who is going to be the person who drives the well-being journey in in the place of work is is there someone people know they can go to to talk honestly and openly to a trusted person about their personal journey um 
chaplain obviously says a lot that 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 says that job description but do you have someone in your organization who you know you can go to about your well-being if not who could be appointed to do that to be that role because it would save a fortune on so much time off etc and it would create a culture where we value you we listen to what you have to say and we want to create space for you to be and to pause in amongst the fact that yes we're human doings but ultimately we're human beings where can we be to find the peace that we need so that we can do really well and that is a great way to end in you can create instant value just by listening um paul thank you very much indeed for joining us it's flown by always a pleasure and hopefully we can speak to you again soon thank you look after yourself This week, good news, we do have time for a quick dad joke. And this is courtesy of the dad joke man on Twitter. Here we go. Don't blame me. What do you get if you divide 22 sheep into seven pens? A shepherd's pie. Yeah, you'll have to think about it. So thank you again for listening to episode four of The Old Man and the CV. Thank you also to my guest today, Paul Sanderson, MBE. You can find his details in the episode notes and you can find him on LinkedIn if you would like to reach out to him directly. So just the credits to go. Music and idents to Abigail Eva Molly Wong. And this is a almost pro production for 23 Magic. See you next time. Santiago Amigos. <laughs>